Now, one thing I really want your generation to embrace is that the Earth is a closed system. We cannot leave the Earth. There's no place to go. You have been taught from the earliest ages that you live on a spinning ball. That NASA has sent men to the moon. And you are the result of a Big Bang explosion which created everything out of nothing. Yet nothing could be farther from the truth. I'm now approaching uh, lunar sunrise and uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light the day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. This idea that uh, you know um, billions of years ago nothing exploded and then everything came out of that nothingness um, ridiculous but um, <clears throat> they try to make you believe that, uh, that the idea that a, um, a supreme being a creator created this is ridiculous compared to that idea I mean um, but you know if you look at it objectively they I, I would lean towards a creator because um, you know, there's so much that points to um, you know, the fingerprint of a, a creator. But it's no less ridiculous than, than nothing exploding and becoming something. Um, in, my, in my opinion, the, the Big Bang theory and uh, the theory of evolution and the baller theory are all interlinked and they're all there to make us feel as though we're insignificant. We're small, small tiny, Miniature. unimportant uh, pieces of slime crawling around on a, on a speck of dust in an infinite universe. If that's true, and there's no purpose, there's no meaning to anything, then the, our owners can do whatever they want with us. The theory, the world is a globe revolving around the sun, has been accepted for so long, it is now widely accepted as fact. Research has revealed 
The Earth is, in reality, not a globe spinning through endless realms of space. Neither spherical, as taught for 500 years, nor able to be fallen from the edges, the flat Earth is exactly as the ancients have taught through Scripture, a fixed mass of land and seas enclosed by a protective dome. Cultures the world over throughout history have all described and reported the existence of a geocentric, stationary, flat Earth. Egyptians, Indians, Mayans, Chinese, Native Americans, and literally every ancient civilization on Earth had a geocentric, flat Earth cosmology. Before Pythagoras, the idea of a spinning ball Earth was non-existent. And even after Pythagoras, it remained an obscure minority view until 2,000 years later, when Copernicus began reviving the heliocentric theory. Proper interpretation of the Bible requires an understanding of the original context in which it was written. God chose a specific time, place, and culture in which to inspire scripture, the ancient Mediterranean and the ancient Near East of the second and first centuries BC. Misreadings of scripture often result from assuming that biblical writers thought, believed, and acted as we do. One of the starkest differences between modern and ancient people is our view of cosmology. The term cosmology refers to the way one understands the structure of the universe. The Israelites believed in a cosmology that was common among the ancient civilizations of the biblical world. It encompassed three parts built up like a layer cake, a heavenly realm, an earthly realm for humans, and an underworld for the dead. This three-tier system is reflected in the Ten Commandments. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. While we understand that the Earth is a sphere orbiting other objects in the void of space, the biblical writers thought of the Earth as a flat disk atop vast waters. Rising from the deep waters below were the foundations of the world, which held the Earth firmly in place. And this idea is reflected in several places throughout Scripture. The foundations of the Earth belong to the Lord. On them He has set the world. Where were you when I laid the Earth's foundation? Tell me if you know. Who measured it? I'm sure you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? What was it built on? Who laid its most important stone? He placed the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. Beneath the earth lay the realm of the dead, often referred to by the Hebrew word Sheol. The Hebrew word for earth, Eretz, is also used, since the graves dug by humans represented gateways to the underworld. This underworld was also connected to the great deep, the uninhabitable abyss beneath everything. In Job, this realm is described in watery terms. The dead tremble under the waters and their inhabitants. Sheol is naked before God, and Abaddon has no covering. Jonah's description is perhaps the most vivid. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever, but you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Ancient Israelites did not think of the sky as a layer of gas. They believed the heavens were separated from the earth by a solid, glass-like dome. This view is reflected in Job. Can you, like him, spread out the skies, hard as a cast metal mirror? Above the solid dome or firmament was an endless area of water. This idea of an area of land and air, sandwiched between water above and water below, is presented in the opening of Genesis. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so and God called the expanse heaven. The firmament surrounded the earth and its edge met the horizon. 
the boundary between light and darkness. It was supported by pillars or foundations thought to be the tops of mountains whose peaks appeared to touch the sky. The earth trembled and shook. The pillars of the heavens rocked back and forth. They trembled because the Lord was angry. The sky dome had portals which God could open to let the waters above fall to the earth. This idea is evident in the story of Noah and his ark. Noah was 600 years old. It was the 17th day of the second month of the year. On that day, all of the springs at the bottom of the oceans burst open. God opened the windows of the sky. Rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. And how did the rain end? The springs at the bottom of the oceans had been closed. The windows of the sky had also been closed and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. God and his heavenly hosts were thought to dwell above the firmament. Thick clouds veil him so that he does not see, and he walks on the vault of heaven. The Lord builds his palace high in the heavens. He lays its foundation on the earth. He sends for the waters in the clouds. Then he pours them out on the surface of the land. His name is the Lord. And what comes after the International Space Station once its mission is over? How do we ensure the presence of humans in space? Well, that's a great question. Uh, the plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is, that is much bigger than what we have today. And it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, via, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, 
we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to. And we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. Uh, this world is very different from what most people think it is. Um, there are very powerful people who essentially rule this world right now. Um, and the ordinary person is a slave in this world. And slaves aren't educated. You know, they're taught what they need to, or, you know, they only need, they need to know, that's it. They're not, they're not taught truth taught what they need to know um, and so you're, you're taught enough so that you can you know do the paperwork and operate the machinery um, but you're not meant to know what's really going on because that's what that's the power they have over us they know what's going on what you know how how this world works we don't so they can control us From the beginning of recorded history, and for thousands upon thousands of years, cultures across the entire world all believed the Earth was flat. Their various cosmologies and cosmogenies differed in slight ways, but their overall geographies and astronomies were incredibly consistent and in fact virtually identical. The Earth was a stationary plane, void of any motion or curvature flat across its entire expanse, except of course for hills, mountains, and valleys. The North Pole was the magnetic monopole center point of the flat Earth, with Polaris, the North Pole Star, situated directly above. Polaris was the only motionless star in the heavens, with all the other constellations revolving perfect circles over the Earth every night. The stars were divided into two categories, known as the fixed stars and the wandering stars. The fixed stars were so called because they were observed then, as we can observe today, to stay fixed in their constellation patterns night after night, year after year, century after century, never changing their relative positions. The wandering stars, what are today referred to as planets, were so called because they were observed then, as we can observe today, to wander the heavens, taking their own unique spirograph-like patterns, making both forward and retrograde motions over and around the Earth during their cycles. The other thing that's uh, about the spinning Earth is looking at the stars. Now, um, directly above the axis of spin is the pole star, Polaris, okay? Um, directly over the North Pole and um, we're told that the reason that all the stars spin around the, uh, the, the North Star is because the, the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. Okay, Seems to make sense because if you put a long exposure camera uh, pointing at the North Star you'll see um, the stars will make perfect circles around, perfect star trails. The only problem is the, um, the Earth is also orbiting the Sun at 67,000 miles an hour, okay? The Sun is moving, dragging the Earth and all the, all the planets up that way or that way um, at 600,000 miles an hour. So why do we see perfect circles, you know? Because that's the slowest speed, <laughs> that's um, uh, slowest motion in that, in that mix. And, and yet the, the Earth is moving 67 times faster that way and 600 times faster that way. So you should see the stars do all sorts of strange mo uh, motions, but you don't. You only see them make these perfect circles. That tells me that it's the stars that are moving, not the Earth. 
I used to really be into astronomy. That was a big thing for me. And I never thought about the fact that the constellations have been the same mm -hmm. for 4,400 years or our recorded history, essentially. They've been the same. Mm -hmm. And you just can't get that in a, in a moving universe. If the, everything's just flying around out there, there's no way. Yeah, if you've seen the standard model right now, yeah. it shows the sun yeah, the spiral. Shooting, yeah, shooting, shooting through the universe. The and spiraling. And the, <laughs> yeah, and everything else spiraling around it as it's going out there. The, the thing is, what, what the scientists will give you is calculations and, uh, you know, and theories why that happens. But we have experience. We, we see things and they either make sense or they don't make sense. And what the, the scientists do is substitute our, our common sense and our intuition for calculations and theory. And we're supposed to believe the calculations rather than what we experience uh, ourselves. Olber's paradox states that if there were billions of stars, which are suns, the night sky would be filled completely with light. As Edgar Allan Poe said, were the succession of stars endless, then the background of the sky would present us a uniform luminosity, since there could exist absolutely no point in all that background at which would not exist a star. The sun and moon were both of equal size, and they too revolved over and around the motionless earth, as immortalized in the Chinese yin-yang symbol. The sun and moon were much closer to Earth than supposed nowadays, and each shined with their own unique opposite lights, the suns being warm, golden, drying, preservative, and antiseptic, and the moon's light being cold, silver, damp, putrefying, and septic. The sun and moon, as though connected to a magnetic maypole, made alternating spiral journeys over and around the Earth every year. The thing about the sun is that we're told it's 93 million miles away. It's not. It's actually something around 3,000 miles away um, and about 34 miles across. Um, that might sound really um, crazy, but um, if you look, at the, um, uh, look out on a day that's uh, got broken cloud, you'll see that the sun rays will come out at an angle. Most people have seen this. The rays come, come down in a, uh, at angles. Um, if the sun was 93 million miles away, then all the light will be coming parallel. So if you imagine, you know, there's no way to show 93 million miles, but, but something way, way over there, all the light that reaches this globe will be parallel. There's no way that light can, can come that far and spread out like that. Now, if you follow those light rays, you'll see exactly where the sun is. And as I said, it works out to be about 3,100 miles. Now, if that's the case, and the sun is circling over this flat plane, yeah, its, it's light range is limited. So it's illuminating the part of the Earth. It's, it's, uh, it's like um, over at the moment. So say over, over Europe, it might, or over Af um, South America there, it's over there, well Australia's going to be in the dark because the sun isn't going to throw enough light to illuminate Australia. High altitude balloon footage has also filmed lighting hot spots on clouds proving the sun to be local and acting as a spotlight and not a burning ball of gas millions of miles away as supposed by heliocentrists. Speaking of the sun, um, there's all kinds of weird things about yeah. the sun when you start actually paying attention to yeah. it. And there is, speaking of high altitude balloon yeah. tests, <laughs> one of the most famous ones on YouTube that everybody's probably seen by now is the dog camera. It's the dog cam. It shows the wing of a support structure uh -huh. that has a camera and there's a little banner on it that says dog cam. <laughs> and it's it, it's probably using some sort of wide angle fisheye lens, but the, the horizon is pretty close to right across the center. Yeah. So you're not really getting the distortion. Yeah. And it's wobbling around a bit. But in several shots, it shows the sun. Mm -hmm. And right below the sun on the Earth is a hot spot. Like right yeah. below the sun. Yeah. Well, if the sun's 93 million miles away and it's so much bigger than the Earth, putting one big parallel lines of yeah. light toward us, how are you going to get a, a hot spot mm -hmm. directly below it? And the other problem with that is, is it's shaking and it's moving, the, the <laughs> camera, the, 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 yeah. the picture is. So you're getting rolling shutter. You, yeah. There is zero motion parallax. 
Now, if you've ever noticed, if you've ever dri driven down a, a road like out in the, yeah. uh, like in Lubbock, Texas, there's mm -hmm. this area where there's li lots of windmills. Yeah. And nothing else. It's flat as could be. Yeah. And windmills <laughs> as far as you can see. And if you're driving, you know, 80 miles an hour or whatever on the highway, mm -hmm. you notice that the windmills that are beside you, the closest to you, they're whipping by. Yeah, <laughs> really fast. But the ones further in the distance, the like further out you go, slow. they're hardly moving. Yep. Now, if the sun is 93 million miles away, then when you see the movement that that, that weather balloon is doing and the horizon's coming in and out of frame and doing yeah. different things like that, there should be a notable difference between the speed at which the horizon is moving and the speed at which the sun, 93 million miles away, if there's motion parallax, yep. should be there should be a difference. Yeah. The problem is they're they're in perfect sync. <laughs> Perfect. The horizon sync. and the horizon and the sun are perfect sync in its movement, <laughs> showing that it has to be a localized object. Most people say, "Well, I see the sun rise and set. How can that be if it's just going round in a circle?" Well, that's perspective again. If you actually see um, video of uh, the sun coming up and, and going down. Um, Many times you'll see that the sun starts off as it's coming up very, very tiny and it gets bigger as it gets closer to midday and then gets smaller again. It's literally that effect of perspective, you know, with some things above you, like the ceiling in a hallway, yeah, as it goes further away, it will, it will seem to sink down towards the horizon until it disappears beyond your, the, the limit of your sight. And that's all you're seeing. You're seeing, you're seeing literally a, a, the sun circling overhead, but seeming to set. There is a lot of water in our atmosphere. And uh, this is the USGS website, usgs.gov, Science for a Changing World. The USGS Water Science School talks about there is always water in the atmosphere. Clouds are, of course, the most visible manifestation of atmospheric water. But even clean air contains water, water in particles that are too small to be seen. One estimate of the volume of water in the atmosphere at any one time is about 3,100 cubic miles, or 12,900 cubic kilometers. If all the water that's in the atmosphere were to rain down at once, it would cover the globe uh, to a depth of about one inch. If the atmosphere, especially over water, is made up of zillions and zillions of tiny convex drops of water, then collectively, perhaps they all combine to make one big convex lens, in which case it would act like a magnifying glass. Refraction causes the light to bend downward. Now we've all seen pictures of, you know, a pencil or something in a glass of water and how not only does refraction bend the image downward, it also magnifies it. The science is the same of that of a lens. Here's a simple example. So if you're looking at, at uh, Chicago here, just maybe you can, now you can just see the top of, uh, of the Sears Tower and if our simulated uh, temperature inversion moves into place, hopefully now you can see all of, pretty much all of yeah, Chicago, see all the lower buildings. Including, including what's at ground level. So the atmosphere really is like acting like a lens. Yes. Science is the same of that of a lens. Here's a simple example. The atmosphere really is like acting like a lens. Yes. Seasons. The sun's annual journey from tropic to tropic, solstice to solstice, is what determines the length and character of days, nights, and seasons. This is why equatorial regions experience almost year-round summer and heat, while higher latitudes north, and especially south, experience more distinct seasons with harsh winters. The sun began its journey at the Tropic of Capricorn at the winter solstice, where it made its fastest and largest circle over the Earth. For the next three months, 
Every day, the sun slightly narrowed its path and slowed its speed until by the spring equinox, the sun had spiraled its way from the Tropic of Capricorn to the equator. Then for the next three months, again, every day, the sun continued to slightly narrow its path and slow its speed until the summer solstice, when the sun made its smallest, slowest circle around the Tropic of Cancer. So when the sun is further away from the North Pole, right, the center of the flat Earth, it's winter in the north and summer in the south. Since the sun is smaller than we are told and closer, it makes much more sense that we experience seasons in the first place. If the sun was 93 million miles away and had a radius of over 400,000 miles, we would hardly experience temperature fluctuation as we do. The heliocentric model claims seasons change based on the ball Earth's alleged axial tilt and elliptical orbit around the sun, yet their flawed current model places us closest to the sun, 91 million miles, in January, when it is actually winter, and farthest from the sun, 94.5 million miles, in July, when it's actually summer throughout most of the Earth. The moon had a similar yearly path revolving over and around the Earth. But unlike the sun, which constantly changed its speed to keep a consistent 24-hour day, the moon's speed never changed. So depending on its latitude, the moon was observed then, as we can observe today, to take approximately 24.7 to 25 hours per cycle. This is why at different times and places during each month, we can see the moon in the morning, afternoon, or night. So for ancient man, Earth and Polaris were the two immovable center points of the universe, around which the sun, moon, and other stars all revolved in a dome-like shape. Some cultures believed in a literal, physical, solid dome or firmament to which the fixed stars were bound. The southern circumference of Earth was surrounded by a gigantic wall of ice, 150 to 200 feet above sea level, holding the interconnected oceans in like a World Cup. Beyond the ice wall, some cultures claimed a firm barrier existed through which no human could penetrate. Distances are very different, and distances and, and, and flight plans are very different on the flat Earth than they are on the ball. Um, and when you look at flights in the southern hemisphere, they, they make some really crazy, um, you know, sort of deviations. So, for instance, if you look on, on here, um, let's say a flight from Cape Town, Cape Town over here to Australia, so say Sydney and Australia, they will, they will take you to Dubai first. Recently, there was um, a case of a, a woman who uh, was pregnant on a flight and she, she was about, to, her waters broke on the flight. And I think it was from the Philippines to, um, to Los Angeles. They were flying across and, and literally, um, she, her waters broke and they had to divert, they had to land. So instead of either going back to the Philippines or going on to uh, Los Angeles, they went, they landed in Alaska. <laughs> Which again, if you look on the, uh, on the flat map, it's again a, a straight path. If the Earth were truly a sphere 25,000 miles in circumference, airplane pilots would have to constantly correct their altitudes downwards so as to not fly straight off into outer space. A pilot wishing to simply maintain their altitude at a typical cruising speed of 500 miles per hour would have to constantly dip their nose downwards and descend 2,777 feet, over half a mile, every minute. Otherwise, without compensation, in one hour's time, the pilot would find themselves 31.5 miles higher than expected. The only thing I do know is that nothing flies um, over the South Pole, um, because again, on a flat map, the, the South Pole, the uh, continent of Antarctica, is the ring around the Earth. So, you know, you can't fly over, over the ring. Um, and, uh, and get anywhere. That's why we're not allowed to go there. There has existed an international Antarctic treaty preventing all independent exploration of Antarctica. Pre-approved guided tours exist which take visitors to a few coastal regions of Antarctica, but no independent exploration of the continent is allowed. I mean, think about it, it's the only treaty that's, that's uh, you know, uh, all these countries have signed and never broken and uh, uh, completely agreed on. It's the only one. Um, you know, what, what treaty is there that everybody's agreed on? Um, 
we're, we're, we're being kept away from it for a reason. You know, they have some scientific bases there, yeah, and, and literally it's controlled by the military. If you try and, uh, and go there by yourself, you will be uh, um, sort of picked up and uh, escorted back. Uh, there was a guy called Jarls Anderhoy who tried to, uh, to take a mission to, to the Antarctica and he was, he was picked up and, uh, and taken back by the military. Um, it's a good reason because they don't want you finding out what's, what's beyond. Admiral Byrd, he actually, he actually did four, four um, expeditions. Aha, and, um, and most of them were military expeditions with huge military groups. Um, you know, th uh, thousands of people, you know, planes, boats, the, the works. After Admiral Byrd came back after his last um, expedition, um, Antarctica was sealed off and both America and um, you know, the, the, the Russians started firing nuclear missiles straight up. Um, now in America that was, that was called uh, uh, Project um, Operation Fishbowl and it came under something called Project Dominic. Well, fishbowl makes, you know, makes sense because uh, it seems like Admiral Byrd found the edge of the dome. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, while he was out there, and as soon as he left there, they started firing missiles straight up. I believe to try and test how far that that dome went. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the uh, the um, footage of these explosions, what you'll see is an explosion. Well, when a when a, a bomb goes off in midair, it's a fireball. It expands in all directions and mostly up. Okay. Now, if you look at these um, explosions on um, Operation Fishbowl, they explode outwards in a ring, which means it's, be it's exploding against something because it can't rise with the heat. So it's exploding against something and exploding outwards. Okay, and the middle of the explosion, you'll see it's, it, it glows, you know, hot, and then it cools over time. So it looks to me like they were exploding against a dome. Now. I said it was um, Operation Fishbowl, obviously Fishbowl, but the, um, uh, there's a chap called Rob Skiba who's, who discovered that the Project Dominic, the word Dominic means of the Lord, Fishbowl of the Lord. <laughs> so they, I, I believe they clearly know that we're in a, an enclosed system and um, Admiral Byrd found the edge and they've, they've tested to see mm -hmm. um, how far it goes up. Now, one thing I really want your generation to embrace is that the Earth is a closed system. We cannot leave the Earth. There's no place to go. There's no place to throw your trash. Last but not least, just as the ancients espoused, the Earth is observably motionless to all our senses, and the horizon remains perfectly flat as far as the eye can see. Not only does the horizon remain perfectly flat, 360 degrees around the observer, but whether at sea level, the top of Mount Everest, 35,000 feet high in an airplane, or even at over 100,000 feet high, the highest any amateur hot air balloon has ever flown, the flat horizon actually rises to the eye level of the observer all the way up. On a globular Earth, no matter how large it is assumed to be, the horizon would remain where it was, and the rising observer would have to tilt his head downwards further and further the higher they rose to see the steadily falling horizon. People also claim to see curvature in GoPro or other high altitude camera footage of the horizon. While it is true that the horizon often appears convex in such footage, it just as often appears concave or flat depending on the tilt and movement of the camera. The effect is simply a distortion due to wide-angle lenses. In lens corrected and footage taken without wide-angle technology, all amateur high-altitude horizon shots appear perfectly flat. The Felix Baumgartner Red Bull dive outside camera shows the same amount of curvature of Earth from surface level to jump height, proving it to be a deceiving fish-eyed wide-angle lens, while the inside regular camera shows a perfectly flat horizon eye level at 128,000 feet, which is only consistent with a flat plane. Many people will be shocked to know that to this day, every single scientific experiment ever devised to show the alleged motion of the Earth has failed to do so, or given evidence of the opposite, that the Earth is indeed motionless, and every attempt ever made to measure the alleged curvature of the Earth has failed to do so, or 
given evidence of the opposite, that the Earth is indeed flat. There was a famous experiment back in the 1800s in England uh, called the Bedford Levels Experiment. Now, the Bedford Levels is a, a canal that uh, is perfectly straight for six miles. Okay, so what um, a chap called Samuel Rowbottom did was he took a telescope, put it in the water about eight inches above the water, and he had a friend, yeah, um, had a friend in a rowboat with a flag on the back, row all the way to the other end, and he was able to see the uh, the flag on the back of the rowboat the whole distance. Now, according to spherical um, trigonometry. Um, the curve of the Earth is eight inches per mile squared. So um, over five miles, um, that's um, five times 525, um, times eight, which is 200, which is, works out, that's 200 inches, which works out at 16 feet. That means the boat should have been 16 feet below the horizon. He shouldn't have been able to see the boat. Now, um, you know, the scientists will say, oh, refraction and this and light bending around the earth and stuff. Um, but, but the fact is, you know, it was, it's perfectly flat. And, and he, he, in his book, he's, uh, he, he puts forward many, many arguments that show that, or many, many experiments that show the earth is always perfectly flat. They say that the, you see the, uh, the mast, you know, go, go down last. It's, it's literally just the way your, your vision works. Yeah, it's perspective and, and atmospherics, basically. Um, the, you, the limit of your vision is supposedly three miles. And then after three miles, you're supposed to see the, the boat start to uh, go over the horizon. It's funny that Neil deGrasse Tyson again says that, um, explains that you can't see uh, the curvature of the Earth from a plane. He says this, you can't see the curvature of the Earth from a plane because you're not high enough. The Earth is so big that um, you can't get high enough to see the curvature. Yet, you can apparently see a boat go over the curvature over the, over the distance of three miles, which doesn't make sense. The thing is, when you, when you um, look out and you see a boat start to go over the horizon, if you suddenly get a pair of binoculars and look, it comes back again. And once it goes out of the sight of your binoculars, if you get a telescope, yeah, it comes back again. It doesn't go over any, any, any curve of the horizon. What we found, um, many people have done experiments with uh, very high powered zoom um, cameras. And they, they've watched a boat go sail out to sea and they've just kept trained on this, on this boat. And what they see is after a, a very long distance, you see an atmospheric effect where um, the bottom of the boat disappears and starts and, and the top of the boat inverts so you see a sort of mirror image and that um, with your eyesight you know you basically the bottom of the boat just melts into the uh, into the horizon the stage was set for one of the most important events in the history of physics the michelson morley experiment the experiment failed to detect the earth moving in or against the ether the problem was serious Although various solutions were advanced, in the end, science was faced with a choice. Either discard the ether, or admit that the Earth wasn't orbiting the Sun. It was Albert Einstein who came up with the solution, which now forms the basis of our physics, and which we call the theory of relativity. Einstein eliminated the ether as the cause, and said that it was simply a principle of nature that when objects move through empty space, they contract in length, they decrease in the time traveled, and their mass increases, all by the same proportion. Hence, in order to maintain the Copernican principle, the length, time, and mass of moving objects were altered. And this is the essence of Einstein's special theory of relativity. In 1871, after getting massive amounts of pressure from the public to address these claims from Flat Earth proponents, Royal Astronomical Society President George Airy devised an experiment which he hoped would once and for all prove Earth's axial motion and forever silence the rabble-rousing Flat Earthers. 
by first filling a telescope with water to slow down the speed of light inside, then calculating the tilt necessary to get the starlight directly down the tube, Airy planned to measure the speed of the telescope, and thereby the speed of the Earth, by extrapolating the amount of tilt needed to keep the starlight coming in straight. The experiment, however, would go down in history and forever be known as Airy's failure, because every time he repeated it, Airy found the starlight was already coming in the correct angle with no change necessary, proving that the stars move relative to a stationary Earth and not the other way around. Airy had meant to prove the heliocentric theory, but instead devised an everlasting proof of the geocentric model. presented to the public by NASA and other government space agencies are as real as a Hollywood motion picture and as scientific, scientific, scientific as science fiction. Science facts, on the other hand, prove the flat earth. There are hundreds of proofs in scientific experiments which have conclusively shown the earth to be a stationary plane. But you have never and will never hear about these heavily censored experiments in our controlled media. Measurements have been repeatedly taken throughout history until modern times to test the Earth's supposed curvature. And every time have proven what our eyes and experience tell us to be true. The Earth simply does not curve downwards. This mythical curvature exists only in the fisheye lens footage they constantly film, in the fake CG images of Earth they constantly propagate. The spinning globe and every argument used to defend it is simply pseudoscience masquerading as truth. Millions of people worldwide are waking up to this incredible rediscovery 